I never had any political aspirations in my life. I uh, was a random voter, didn't really have a whole lot of party affiliation. Um, came from Massachusetts, you know, and I was building my own home in Monterey a little over 30 years ago. And I had to go before the Architecture Review Committee. And uh, no idea really what the group does. I realize they've got something to do with the city of Monterey. But it's a colonial home and it has two bay windows in the front of it. I go before the Architecture Review Committee and this woman on the committee says, well, you know, the house, I like the house, but I've always hated bay windows. So get rid of those bay windows and I'll approve the house. And I said, well, that's not really a reason. I said, that's like a bias or a prejudice. It's a colonial home. Collaborate siding, shutters, shingles, bay windows. She said, maybe you didn't hear me. Get rid of the bay windows and we'll approve your house. So I said, okay, fine. So I knocked the bay windows out, I get the house approved. About four months later, there's an ad for the, a vacancy on the Architecture Review Committee. And Pat, my ex-wife, uh, says, uh, uh, hey, Mr. Smarty, you ought to get on the Architecture Review Committee and set those guys straight. I said, you have to be kidding me. Why would I want to go do that? She says, well, then you can't complain anymore because you didn't do anything about it. So I, I ended up on the Architecture Review Committee, and then it was kind of, downhill ever since. I was on the planning commission. I was on the architecture review committee for four years. I was on the Arch planning commission, architectural for four, planning for two, planning commission for two years. Then I ran for city council in a field of seven with the two incumbents running. Um, I got elected to the council. I was on the council for four years and then I uh, ended up going over to the county. So it was a complete accident. Uh, I, I really hadn't intended for this to be you know, a 30-year uh, tour of duty in the public sector, but it's been fascinating. I became very interested in, in the process of, of local government. I actually thought moving over to the county was kind of a lateral move. I realized the responsibilities were, were different, but I didn't realize the magnitude of the difference, that there is a significant amount of additional roles and responsibilities that you do take on as a county supervisor. Um, I, being on the city council was, was a, a great honor. It was a, it was a, I loved being with the city um, and I was amazed at the complexities of county government. I mean, we, we have all in excess of 5,000 employees. Uh, our budget last year was a billion three. Uh, we have an incredible hospital, we have a jail, we have public safety, we have social services. The incredible diversity of the responsibilities of the county has been fascinating. But again, um, I, I was interested in local government. It seemed like the next logical step, but I didn't realize what a, a quantum leap it was from city government to county government. I think it's the, the diversity of the responsibilities. Um, you know, uh, my schedule is, is complicated. The topic I'm dealing with changes about every two hours. So I could be dealing with a social service issue one minute, and then the next minute I'd be dealing with a land use issue. Then after that, we'd have a public safety issue, maybe some ag issue. And so it kept, keeps constantly changing. For me, I mean, I have a great case of ADD, which I think is a great asset. Um, because with the changing of subjects, I'm about at my maximum attention span after about an hour and a half. So it's, it's probably time for a change of topics. So this has worked out very well for me uh, to be able to go ahead and actually deal with a, a, an incredible diverse menu of topics. Uh, I think that uh, if I had to say what's the biggest challenge it's the ability to actually affect change. In, in this office, in the 5th District office, I'd say 80 to 85 percent of the work is land use related. It's, um, it's got to do with somebody wanting to do something in the development world. It's got somebody who doesn't want something happening in the development world. It's one neighbor against another neighbor. Um, it's a really, really complex topic in this district. And if you look at the diversity of the district, you look at Big Sur, Big Sur is a community unto its own. It'd really rather be left alone, perhaps a little anarchistical, but if you look at Pebble Beach, more over to the right side of the aisle, uh, more of a, a country club kind of community, 
And so you have that level of diversity where a constituent in Pebble Beach certainly doesn't look like one in Kashawa, and somebody who lives in Kashawa really doesn't look like somebody who lives in Las Palmas. And understanding how to represent that level of diversity, whether it's economic or social, that's a challenge. And it's taken a long time to get to understand each community has its own independent thought and attitude, and understanding where that community is coming from, it takes a while. And I think we've had some transportational and water challenges, um, and those issues certainly have taken a long, long time to uh, get to any form of resolution. Uh, I believe that from a water standpoint, and 5th District spe specific, and uh, you know, nine, Order 9510, which said we had to stop over pumping the Carmel River, I think we're very close to actually coming to resolution on that. In the transportation world, uh, we're never going to pave our way out of our transportation problems. We need to look at alternative modes of transportation. There are some projects, I think, that can make a difference. The East Side Parkway, an alternative route into Salinas through Fort Ord off of uh, Highway 68. I think that will help with congestion on 68 and Highway 1. I've been a big advocate for rail service. I think that uh, extending rail service, commuter rail service down from the Bay Area to the city of Salinas will help relieve some of the congestion on Highway 101, one of the most dangerous sections of highway in this uh, state. Um, we've also done millions and millions of dollars worth of projects. Um, we've done the Prunedale Improvement Project. We've done the Salinas Road Interchange. We spent millions of dollars on the Big Sur Coast. We've actually done a, a lot of, of, of uh, solutions um, and addressed a lot of problems. One of the things I'm disappointed in right now is to see the devolution of the Fort Rios plan. Um, Fort Ord was the largest base closure in the United States. It was uh, in excess of 27,000 acres. 20,000 acres were put in open space habitat and recreation. And we said, from a development standpoint, we won't build on the coast, we won't build in Carmel Valley, and we won't build on Prime Ag. And we agreed as a community that we would do a replacement program where we would replace some of the jobs that used to exist at Fort Ord. About 30,000 people used to work there. We developed a plan, the Fort Ord Reuse Plan, the number one base reuse plan in the United States by the Architects Institute of America. And we all agreed that this was where we would put back some of the jobs that were lost. And we'd recognize that the communities of Salinas, Marina, Seaside, and the greater Monterey County area and the Tri-County area had been economically impacted by that loss of that military component. And to now see that there's opposition to development on what used to be a closed military base with armed guards and razor wire around the perimeter. For me, that's a little bit of a disappointment when we said socially we do the right thing for those communities. Um, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, I hope that people will recognize that that's something we need to stand behind. Um, but I think there will always, there's always going to be challenges. There's never going to be a shortage of controversial issues that we need to deal with in local government. And government will be asked to do more with less on an ongoing basis. There's some large ones and there's some little ones. I, I like to think that uh, my office excelled in public service. Um, the team that I had in my office, Kathleen, uh, Jane, Brian, um, we really addressed the public's issues effectively, efficiently, and professionally, and I'm extremely proud of those guys. Uh, if there's one thing I miss, I'll miss. And there's a lot of things I'm not going to miss, let me tell you. Uh, but the one thing I'll miss is not working with those guys on a daily basis. And I, and I think the constituents will realize that the level of service that they got from the team we had here uh, was excellent. I mean, I was a quarterback, but no quarterback wins a game. You need a really, really strong front line. And I had, a, I had the best front line any supervisor could ever ask for. And I'm, I'm sorry to see that uh, pass. I, I'm, uh, I'm proud of that. I consider that an accomplishment. If you look at projects, um, we finally solved um, some of the congestion on the Carmel Hill by creating the climbing lane coming from Carmel Valley Road up to the top of uh, Ocean Avenue on up the hill. Um, we'd had a decades-long, multi-decades-long multi argument about a superhighway that should have gone in in Hatton Canyon. You can have debates and discussions about issues ad nauseum, but really you're supposed to do something. And I think that was indicative of doing something that made a difference. Did it solve the problem in its entirety? No, but it made a difference. 
One of the things I'm extremely proud of that doesn't necessarily affect the 5th District that greatly, but that's the turnaround in the Tividad Hospital. I was, uh, at, had a key part in that um, as a, a board member and as a spokesman for the hospital. I've been on the Board of Trustees for, for quite a while. That hospital was in the red to the tune of at least $30 million a year. It was a major drain on the general fund. We can now say that that hospital is in the black, it's operating very efficiently, very effectively. It's got a trauma designation. It is a world-class hospital. It got a A-plus rating from a recent survey from a leapfrog group. And I think that kind of turnaround is unprecedented elsewhere in this state, perhaps even this country. When most safety net hospitals, when most county hospitals are subsidized, Natividad isn't. I think that's a huge turnaround. I think it says a lot socially, it says a lot economically, and it says a lot about the priorities of the county. My mother uh, raised me that, you know, you don't just take from a community, but you give back, that you actually participate in your community. My mother, you know, volunteered on a regular basis at the senior center. She drove for the Cancer Society. She worked in the thrift shop and she gave back to the community and she instilled in me that that's what we need to do as citizens, that we don't just take, we actually give back. Uh, you know, President Kennedy once said of those to whom much has been given, much is asked. And I think that I feel that I answered that call in that I have given, you know, 30 years of my time. Um, as a county supervisor, that is incredibly time consumptive. Um, when you're a city council person or a planning commissioner, it's almost under the heading of, of volunteerism. You don't get financially compensated. Um, and there was a time when, you know, as an uh, elected official, you were a statesman. You weren't a politician. Now you're a politician, and that statesman-esque piece, I think, has been lost. Um, you know, you came forward, you volunteered, you did the public work, and it wasn't so much a career as it has become, and there wasn't this ladder that you climbed up, but rather you just came forward and participated in your community. I'd, I'd like to think I came forward, I did a good job, I put together a great team that really excelled in, in public service, and that's what we're supposed to be, is public servants, you know, doing the public service, and I, I'm, I'm proud of that. And I, I, I leave office um, with a sense of accomplishment and also, quite frankly, again, great sense of relief because this is not an easy job. You're, you're subject to criticism on a regular basis. You can't really respond. I'd say one of the most difficult things that's shown up on the horizon as of late is uh, social media where people can put things out there in the public realm that aren't necessarily true, they're inaccurate, they're inflammatory, and it sends the debate and the focus of public dialogue in the wrong direction, if you ask me. And I think that's unfortunate, that there's no fact-checking, that everything that's out there is assumed to be factual, and, and an overwhelming majority of the time it isn't. But I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be rejoining the ranks of the public sector, but I do think that uh, my office did a great job serving the public over the course of time. I would hope there are a lot of people that are interested, um, but I, I would hope that they're not into it for the blood sport of politics. I, I would hope that they're interested in it because they want to serve the community. I would advise that if you're sensitive, if you don't take criticism well, and if you don't like people and what people have to say, it's probably not the best career choice for you. But if you, if you enjoy a diversity of topics, if you thrive on debate and understand that you may not always win that debate, but when there's public discourse and public controversy and public discussion, if it's done for the right reasons and in the right manner, you can be productive. Public service is a, is, a, is, a, is a great opportunity for people to make a difference in this world, whether it's at the local level or whether it's at the state or federal level. Um, and I never went on to state or federal office um, because I always thought that, you know, if you do, it becomes very, very partisan. And if you stray from your party for any reason, 
then you're not apt to be considered a party loyalist and your office is perhaps in the basement, you don't get committee appointments, and you don't really uh, advance in a bipartisan manner because things are so polarized now. I, I really am disappointed in what we see, even at the local level. The public rhetoric is so harsh these days and public anger and frustration is so great that I think it, it scares so many people away that should come forward and participate. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've been asked, why do you do this? I mean, and I go, well, you know, it's actually very interesting and it, and it, it challenges you mentally uh, to go ahead and try to figure out how to do the right thing. And uh, everybody to the T says, you gotta be out of your mind, I couldn't possibly do that. And I'd, I'd just rather, you know, do my job. Well, you know, going to work and doing your job is great, but really, I think it's important for people to come forward and do something for the community. Um, you know, we don't need necessarily depend on our retirees to go ahead and be the volunteers in this community. We should volunteer when we're young, when we're vital, when we have opinions, when we have the energy to go out and do the right thing. So I'd, I'd encourage more involvement. I'd encourage people to, but to come forward, not with anger in their hearts or frustration, but with a desire to bring people together to make the right kind of decisions. If it's, if it's time for change, then make the right change to change. But don't change just for change's sake. Know what you want to do, know where you want to go, know where you want to take the city, the county, the state, or this nation, but do it with the understanding that you're not always going to win, and compromise is truly the best way to go. You know, I've said it before, but perfection is the enemy of good. The art of compromise is the art of good government for me.